respected President Dr. Nelson Mandela, respected Vice President Sri K. R. Narayanan, uh, Mrs. Usha Narayanan, Excellencies, friends. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to this function being held by the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation as part of the 50th birth anniversary celebration of my late husband. We are deeply grateful to President Mandela for agreeing to deliver this memorial lecture, and I am touched that he has made time for it in spite of his strenuous schedule. I know how much my late husband admired and esteemed our honored guest of today. In October 1990, seven months before his assassination, he had greeted Dr. Mandela on his first visit to India with the words, I quote, in welcoming you to India, we welcome a part of ourselves, for the freedom of India started in South Africa, and our freedom will not be complete till South Africa is free. <laughs> this strong affinity that my late husband felt was born out of a shared consciousness of struggle and resistance to colonial domination. It was based on the concept of human dignity as passionately held by him as it had been by his mother, Indira Gandhi, and by her father, Jawaharlal Nehru. To them, racism was the negation of human dignity, and the system of apartheid was an abomination. Rajiv Gandhi, was proud of India's role as a front rank fighter against apartheid. He, in turn, carried the banner of South African freedom with burning conviction, ardor, and energy to every global forum, to the United Nations, the Non-Aligned Movement, the Commonwealth, and through the Africa Fund to the conscience of the world. Although he did not live to share the joy of that glorious moment of South Africa's liberation. He believed absolutely that it would be attained. He had foretold in 1987, I quote, the century from Mahatma Gandhi to Nelson Mandela has seen brutality in South Africa degenerate into barbarism. But like the Mahatma, Mandela will emerge victorious. Unquote. <laughs> the nobility of President Mandela's personal example, his fortitude, his strength of principle made him an inspiration to all his African brothers and sisters and a hero to the entire world. He comes. <laughs> He comes to us today as the head of a new South Africa in which all her peoples can enjoy the basic human rights of freedom and equality. At the end of his moving and memorable autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, President Mandela shares his profound understanding of the mission that destiny has given to him, and I quote, the truth is that we are not yet free. We have merely achieved the freedom to be free, the right not to be oppressed. For to be free is not merely to cast off one's, one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and denounces the freedom of others. The true test of our devotion to freedom is just beginning." Unquote. I am sure I speak for all of us here in expressing my faith that President Mandela's wisdom and statesmanship will continue to guide South Africa and the international community on humanity's walk to freedom. May I now invite our Vice President to speak. Thank you.
Your Excellency, Dr. Nelson Mandela, President of the Republic of South Africa, Srimadi Sonia Gandhi, Chairperson, Rajiv Gandhi Foundation, Dr. Abid Hussain, Vice Chairman, Rajiv Gandhi Institute for Contemporary Studies, ladies and gentlemen. To speak about Rajiv Gandhi is always a moving experience. This is the golden jubilee year of his birth. Today, he would have been still in the prime of his life. During the short period of his life, he left a permanent imprint on the minds and hearts of people in India as well as in the world. It is a matter of great honor for us that the Rajiv Gandhi Golden Mem Jubilee Memorial Lecture is being given by His Excellency Dr. Nelson Mandela. Rajiv Gandhi had described Dr. Nelson Mandela, Mandela as one of the greatest men of our time. Earlier in 1982, Prime Minister Srimadi Indira Gandhi said in New Delhi, and I quote, we regard Nelson Mandela as one of the foremost proponents of freedom. We have honored him as one of our own heroes, quotation ends. That this authentic hero is before us today as the head of state for the liberated, democratic, multiracial South Africa is one of the dreams of the Indian people come true. Called upon to take the charge of the nation in difficult and tragic circumstances, Rajiv Gandhi lifted the sights of our people to the future, to the oncoming 21st century. On becoming Prime Minister, he declared that in the changing situation in India and in the world, new thinking was required and that the ideologies we have pursued must be reapplied to suit the changes on the ground. We have, he observed, to fuse the wisdom of our seers with the insights and artifacts of science and technology. He ushered, a, in, he ushered in a new phase of modernization and technological transformation, sowing the seeds of the economic liberalization that is sweeping the country today under the leadership of Sri Narasimha Rao. A firm believer in the acquisition and the development of the highest of high technologies for the progress of the nation, he also launched programs for rural development, employment generation, eradication of poverty, and the building up of democratic institutions of local self-government at the grassroots level. The implementation of these programs have created a new stir in India's social, economic, and political life and new hope among women and other weaker sections of our society. Rajiv Gandhi's vision and work touch the wider horizons for the world. For, no, for nation building, he said, the first prerequisite is peace, peace with our neighbors and peace in the world. He initiated a new dialogue with our fraternal neighbor, Pakistan, worked for the promotion of regional cooperation in South Asia and brought about a breakthrough in relations with our great neighbor, China. In the realm of wider international relations, he played a dynamic and effective role. Indeed, there are few instances in history of someone so untutored in foreign policy and diplomacy previously, emerging within such a short period as a world figure and making such an impact on the world scene and world leaders. Rajiv Gandhi fought for peace and disarmament in the grand tradition of Indian foreign policy, pleading for the creation of a, of a nuclear weapon-free 
and a non-violent world, disputing the great power theology that nuclear weapons keep the peace. He said, and I quote, this is false. If nuclear weapons exist, they will one day be used as they were in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as all weapons have been used in history. Quotation ends. This is why he placed before the United Nations a plan for the elimination of all nuclear weapons and proposed a new and non-discriminatory treaty to replace the present non-proliferation treaty. Rajiv Gandhi's most fervent efforts in foreign policy were, however, devoted to the dismantling of the last fortresses of colonialism and racialism in the world. I have had the opportunity of seeing him function at the Non-Aligned Summit at Harare. I saw how the elder statesmen of Africa insisted that he should take up the chairmanship of the Africa Fund, which he gladly did. He fought fiercely for the ending of apartheid in South Africa at non-aligned conferences, at United Nations, and at the Commonwealth meetings. If India was the first to break off diplomatic relations, impose economic sanctions, and agitate, and agitate the South African question at the United Nations, it was India under Rajiv Gandhi that clinched the issue in the last days of apartheid at the United Nations and within the Commonwealth. He declared, and I quote, the only way is totally to isolate the races. It is futile to hope that cooperation in any manner with that regime will give any leverage or influence to change things for the better. Quotation ends. Observing that the champions of human rights collude with racism, he admonished, let not the Commonwealth be charged with cowardice in action and bravery in words. At another time, he exclaimed, how long will considerations of commercial gain and misperceived strategic advantage prevent them from compelling the South African regime to give freedom and dignity to all the people? Quotation ends. Ultimately, the entire Commonwealth came around, though some, as Rajivji put it sarcastically, gave the impression of being dragged, kicking, and protesting. While all this drama was being enacted at the International Fora, Rajiv Gandhi knew the central fact and said, I quote, let us remember that in the final reckoning, it is not we who will bring about a change in South Africa, but the people of South Africa themselves. They will win through their valor, their inflexible will, their infinite capacity for sacrifice. Protestants. You, Mr. President, have been the leader and the hero of that epic struggle, and the personification of the valor, the inflexible will, and the capacity for sacrifice for the great people of South Africa. Last year, I had the good fortune to represent India at the inauguration of Dr. Nelson Mandela as the executive president of New South Africa. It was a solemn ceremony, but also a profoundly moving one with mass participation and popular jubilation. Among the questions asked of me by the South African Broadcasting Corporation at that time was the role of Mahatma Gandhi in India's connection with South Africa. I answered that Mahatma Gandhi was the gift of South Africa to India. Indeed, <laughs> indeed Gandhiji himself had once remarked that though he was born in India, he was made in South Africa. He told the Kanbu session of the Indian National Congress in 1925, I quote, it is perfectly true that whatever service I have, done, I have been able to render to India comes from South Africa. 
It has been sometimes argued by hostile critics that Gandhiji's struggle in South Africa was confined to the rights of the Indian community and was not for the majority of the people there. Enlightened opinion in the world had looked upon it quite differently. Count Leo Tolstoy from faraway Russia wrote to Gandhiji and I quote, and so your activity in Transvaal, as it seems to us at the other end of the world, is the most essential work now being done in the world and in which not only the nations of the Christians but all of the world will undoubtedly take part, quotation marks. Perhaps Gandhiji was one of the first to attract the attention of the world to the issue of racism in South Africa. If it was done in the beginning through the medium of the Indian question, it only added urgency, pungency, and the lasting quality of national interest to a larger principle and a fundamental issue of the rights and dignity of the human being. As Gandhiji pointed out, when back in India, there is a moral bond between Asiatics and South Africans. It will grow as time passes. And, Nehru, and as Nehru pointed out much later, the question of the people of the Indian descent in South Africa has really merged into bigger questions where not only Indians are affected, but the whole African population. Dr. Nelson Mandela had acknowledged most generously the influence of India and the Indian National Congress on the African struggle. Writing from his prison cell in Robben Island, when news of the Jawaharlal Nehru Award to him reached him there, he pointed out the close bonds that existed between our people and the people of India and the encouragement, the inspiration and the practical assistance we have received as a result of the international outlook of the All India Congress. But as Rajiv Gandhi put it, it is your people, Excellency, who waged the long and bitter struggle. And it is you who led them to victory. In that struggle, you adopted Gandhian methods of non-violence and satyagraha, and you were compelled later by circumstances to adopt violent methods of an underground movement. But I dare say that your struggle and your movement were based essentially on truth and the spirit of non-violence. How else could one explain your indomitable spirit of resistance and the triumph of your soul force after long years of struggle and suffering and 27 years of incarceration? How else could one explain the spirit of charity and forgiveness that you have shown after victory and the peaceful reconciliation you have achieved in South Africa in launching a rainbow nation after the long walk through the valley of the shadow. Today, you are Excellency, the head of a great multiracial state. In your long walk to freedom, Mr. President, you have crossed famous rivers, as the African saying goes. You have great challenges to face and vast opportunities in front of you. We in India have no doubt that you will face them successfully and avail of the opportunities to the fullest extent. In the tradition of our historic brotherhood, we extend our cooperation to you in the spirit that, that Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi, and that now Madhusudan Rao, and indeed all other leaders and the people of India extended to the good and brave people of South Africa. We are two countries linked by the vast Indian Ocean in the present era of regional and international cooperation. In the implementation of the ambitious and imaginative reconstruction and development program 
that you have launched, there is much that our two countries can do together. Your country with immense resources, hard-working people and wise leadership will, we are sure, play an important role in the Indian Ocean region, in Africa and in the world. I believe that cooperation between India and South Africa could give a powerful impetus to South-South cooperation and contribute the ba to the balance and stability of the world in the era of a pluralist international order. Excellency, may I now invite you to deliver the, the Rajiv Gandhi Golden Jubilee Lecture. Thank you. Madam Chairperson, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen, whenever I appear in gatherings of this nature, and received complimentary remarks. I'm always keen to put these remarks in context. I have had very harsh experiences in my life. times because her people don't take notice of me. I went to a green farm in South Africa and I spent the whole day there. As I was preparing to leave, three ladies walked up to me, and amongst other things they said, we are very happy to get the opportunity to shake hands with you. We were wondering whether we would get this opportunity and we're happy that we have had the pleasure to shake hands with you. And said there are many nice things which, as you know, ladies can say to a gentleman. <laughs> then having said that, they said goodbye and started walking away. But they turned around and asked the question, by the way, who are you? <laughs> I hope at least as Sonia and the Vice President know who I am. <laughs> but uh, the most uh, devastating remark was made by a young lady of about five years. A few days before my 75th birthday, she stormed into my lounge from next door, didn't knock, came in, didn't greet, and she says, how old, she said, how old are you? I said, well, I can't remember, but I was born long, long ago. 
said, a year ago? <laughs> I said, no, longer than that. Two years? I said, uh, no, longer than that. But for how long? I said, well, I've already said I can't remember, but it was a long, long time ago. Then she suddenly switched and asked, why did you go to jail? I said, no, I didn't go there before because I liked. Some people sent me there. And she said, who? I said, people who don't like me. And she said, how long did you remain there? Again, a year, two years, and so on. But she insisted. Now tell me, how long, but how long did you remain there? I said, well, I have already said I can't remember. And she said, you are a stupid old man, aren't you? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I hope uh, after listening to my remarks, you will be more diplomatic than that young man. <laughs> Somebody has got my glasses, my reading glasses. Just over four years ago, when I landed on these shores, I was greatly humbled by the sense of occasion and the great symbolism of the event. For me, it was an opportunity at last uh, to retrace the footsteps of Gandhiji between our two countries and continents. It was an opportunity to pay tribute to Pandit Nehru, the Prime Minister of Independent India and one of the greatest world leaders whose ideas and force of example profoundly influenced my own political outlook. Among the memories indelibly etched in my heart are the touching welcoming words of then Congress party leader Rajiv Gandhi, and I quote, the freedom of India started in South Africa, and our freedom will not be complete till South Africa is free, unquote. Profound in their simplicity, moving in their sincerity and immortal in their accuracy. These sentiments came flashing back when I was informed of the invitation to address this august gathering. Griff consolation and fulfillment wrapped in one is what enveloped me. Grief in remembering the tragic fact of a young life cut down in its prime. Consolation in knowing that it is his strength and the frailty of the assassins which will live on for generations. And 
fulfillment in the realization that those welcoming words can today come to life in their full bloom. On behalf of the people of South Africa, I come on this occasion to say to Rajiv, Pandit and Mahatma, indeed to the people of India, your freedom can now reach its zenith because the people of South Africa are at last free. Over the years, our peoples have extolled the many issues that bind us. The cold effects of geography and history, the shared passion in pursuit of justice and happiness, and the golden trail of principled actions in aid of the struggling people of our country. All this and much more are the solid foundation upon which our new relations are taking shape. They are at the root of our emotion when we say to come to India is for us a homecoming, a pilgrimage to the shrine of great leaders and a great people we shall always admire. I bring you greetings from the people of South Africa. In their multitudes and diversity, they extend their hands across the miles and oceans to profoundly thank the people of India for helping set them free. They are deeply conscious of the sentiments Rajiv Gandhi expressed that you did so knowing that you were by your actions also helping to set yourselves free for you saw our tears as reason enough for your own sorrow. The blood that we shed as the loss of your own self. Today, we come with a new confidence that both our nations have met at their trust with destiny. Tomorrow, as we join you to celebrate the independence of India, we shall, in a sense, be celebrating our own victory. For without India's victory, ours would have been that much more difficult to attain. This is the spirit that infused our earlier engagements today. The joyous welcome by President Sharma and the signing of agreements with Prime Minister Narasimha Rao. What these agreements represent is the beginning of a new epoch in relations between India and South Africa. But they also signify a challenge whose meeting we can no longer postpone. For as the dust of the rhythm of celebration settles down, a 
had the beat of drums and cymbals, cymbals died down, standing starkly before us at the task bequeathed us by Mahatma and Panditji. If we have reached an exalted summit in our joint march to freedom, the wider view that this affords us in South Africa is littered with the destruction of apartheid that we never fully appreciated. The collapse of the social fabric and infrastructure, the immorality and wastefulness in the corridors of apartheid power, and the wrapping, the warping, of the collective mind of slave and slave master alike. And as we awaken to the profundity of these realities, our appreciation of the daunting task ahead of us becomes clearer. We in South Africa are convinced that it is both possible and practicable to reach our goal of a better life for all in the short possible time. We derive our confidence from the knowledge that this is a vision shared by the overwhelming majority of South Africans across the color and political divides. And we fully appreciate the role of the international community in making this happen, not only in the form of material support. If we are able today to speak proudly of a robot nation, united in its diversity of culture, religion, race, language, and ethnicity, it is in part because the world has set us a moral example which we dare to follow. This achievement is bound to last because it is founded on the realization that reconciliation and nation building mean, among other things, that we should set out to know the truth about the terrible past and ensure it does not recur. Ours must therefore not be merely a respite before the bitterness of the past, before the bitterness of the past once more reasserts itself. We recognize too that reconciliation and nation building would remain pious words if they were not premised on a concerted effort to remove the real roots of past conflict and injustice. Our national security and the survival of our young democracy depend above everything else on the program to meet the basic needs of the people. Reconstruction and development will ensure that all South Africans have a stake in life, that they share an interest in the well-being of the country as a whole. Jawaharlal Nehru taught us that the right to a roof over one's head and affordable services, a job and reasonable income, education and health facilities are more than just a bonus to democracy. It is the essence of democracy itself, the essence of human rights. This requires economic growth and investment, rational utilization of the resources at our disposal, human resource development, and urban renewal, to quote but a few examples. 
we state all these principles not because they are novel. Rather, it is to underline the fact that we have keenly followed the experiences of India and other developing countries, and we seek to learn from you. It is also to emphasize that India has a crucial role to play in our endeavors, inasmuch as we have an important role to play in your efforts. Our discussion this morning with President Sharma and Prime Minister Rao have laid a firm basis for this. The Joint Commission, which has been established, and the principle of interstate relations, which have been signed, are certain to lead to the rapid development of all round the bilateral relations. This is because we are rectifying an anomaly so that our two nations, bound together by history, geography, politics, and economic attributes, can develop the special relationship that these factors dictate. I just want to explain that when you see me wiping my eyes, I am not crying. <laughs> As I pointed out elsewhere, this is my unique manner of drawing attention to myself. <laughs> This is crucial for us in South Africa because we know we shall benefit from the rich tapestry of your experience in areas of socio-economic development such as housing, education, and health. From your indigenous technology conducive for developing nations from the possibility of training in many areas, including management of the state apparatus. As South Africans, we are also examining the question how we can follow India's example to become an important part of the international effort for peace, development and cooperation especially now in a world that is abandoning the equations of the past. Certainly, this new reality has its own potentially negative effects. But to help change the world requires that we start from the point of view of the positive elements and possibilities that exist. Firstly, international relations today can be conducted without the operation of military and ideological blocks which tend to cloud the fundamental issues at hand, including human rights and political freedom. Secondly, this has made it possible for the crucial question that have plagued humanity for centuries to come to the fore. The fact of the social disparity among and within nations and the need to raise the global quality of life. Third, international bodies, particularly the United Nations, are re-examining their role to take on board as a central theme the issues of socio-political rights on a global scale. Lastly, social and political renaissance in many developing countries 
is helping set the tone for renewed confidence, mutual cooperation, and a more effective voice. The times might have been different and the certain somewhat skewed. But when the leaders of the previous epoch of the caliber of Pandit Nehru, Abdul Nasser, Kwame Nkrumah, Sukano, Albert Lutuli, Alendo, and others initiated and set to build on the spirit of Pandu, their prime concern was not merely military non-alignment. They had as their prime objective political freedom and socio-economic development. The conditions under which we operate today make it even more necessary and practicable for us to pursue this cause. Thus, in seeking to strengthen Indo-South African relations, we do so also motivated by the need to forge a partnership whose significance should outstrip the narrow confines of our own self-interest. While we should seek to explore one another's lucrative markets, take maximum advantage of trade and investment opportunities, expand the cultural, sporting, and tourist relations, cooperate on security matters, including the combating of drug trafficking, we would be less than equal to the task at hand if we did not realize the broader canvas within which this has to take place. The natural edge of the facts of history and geography that Nero spoke of should broaden itself to include exploring the concept of an Indian Ocean rim of socio-economic cooperation and other peaceful endeavors, of a special relationship that should help improve the lot of the developing nations in multilateral institutions such as the United Nations, Commonwealth, and non-aligned movements. Therefore, if there is any central challenge that this occasion of the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation presents us with, it is to develop the tenacity required to pursue goals that are old and familiar, yet new and not fully explored in the current world milieu. For that, we require creative, bold, and innovative minds. The kind of mind which, in Rajiv's own words, is probing, restless, and takes nothing for granted. A mind that refuses to acquiesce to anything shoddy, that insists on bettering even the very best. As I look around here, I see the faces of many South Africans, including my lifelong friend here, Father Trevor Huddleston. The a victory of the democratic forces against apartheid is the result of the collective efforts of many individuals, past and present. 
it could not be achieved by one individual. But if ever somebody would be tempted to say from the point of view of the forces within South Africa, Father Trevor Huddleston played an extremely key role in that campaign. That would not be an overstatement. And I'm very happy indeed had to see him amongst us. I see many South African faces which I thought I had left behind. <coughs> and I hope all of you <coughs> will see the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Alfred Zoe, because I would like to shake hands with each and every one of them. But of course, the people of India are part and parcel of the population of South Africa by virtue of their actions. I sincerely wish I could put each and every one of you in my pockets <laughs> and go away back to South Africa with all of you. I wish I could put you especially in this pocket which is nearer my heart. Finally, I wish the Rajiv Gandhi Foundation all the best, and I'm confident that in death, as in life, Rajiv will continue to cement the unity of the people of India and their various organizations, as well as the bonds of cooperation between India and South Africa. <laughs> May our relations grow from strength to strength and bring a better life to all our peoples. Elsewhere, I utter the following words. And I would like to repeat them on this occasion. Right down the centuries, and in every part of the world, men and women come and go. Some leave nothing behind them, not even their name. It would seem that they never existed at all. Others do live something behind. The haunting memory of the evil deeds they committed against their fellow human beings. Every time their names are mentioned, feelings of contempt and revulsion well up in our hearts. 
and there is a third category. Also of men and women who leave something behind. Men and women who have chosen the entire world as the theater of their operation, as the background for their idea, who join issue with all those who are guilty, directly or indirectly, of violating human rights. These are the people who put sunshine in the hearts of the very poor, who make all human beings feel that life is rewarding, is worth living. They are immortal. Rajiv Gandhi is a stronger candidate for that immortality. Thank you. Excellencies and friends, on behalf of Madame Sonia Gandhi, Chairperson of the Foundation and the Institute, permit me to propose a vote of thanks. First, our thanks go to you, Excellency President Nelson Mandela, for an inspiring address that you delivered this afternoon. Your words will ring in our ears in our years, for years to come. How beautifully you put it, that India is now in a position to touch the height of its glory because South Africa is free. We love South Africa and we'll never abandon you, we'll always be on your side. May I, Mr. Vice President, sir, thank you for presiding over this function and for lending it dignity. And in the end, I thank all of you who responded so well to our invitation and so spontaneously came in these large numbers. Thank you.